hand it off uh, to Sarah and Larson. Um, oh, six, seven weeks ago, um, maybe six weeks ago, Sarah sent a few of us um, a talk by Dr. Henry Cloud uh, titled um, The Psychology of Crisis. And uh, you could tell that uh, I really uh, felt it was helpful. I've mentioned it in a couple of sermons. Um, thought it was just so helpful, um, not just for um, the COVID-19 crisis, but really these principles apply to just the crises that life brings our way. Um, and so I just, I just found it to be really helpful. Um, uh, threw out to Sarah the idea, hey, would you mind leading uh, maybe a, a summary of his talk and then um, maybe, you know, insert some of your own just experience and training and teaching um, and maybe have a Q&A after that. And, and uh, you know, she followed up and said she would love to do that. Uh, asked Larson if he would be part of that, which is great. Um, if you haven't watched the, uh, the talk or been part of the, uh, the seminar that uh, Dr. Cloud has, you still, I no doubt, will derive benefit from tonight. No doubt about that. In fact, it may kind of salt the oats and you may want to go listen to the talk yourself. It's, it's a little longer. I think it's an hour, what, 20 minutes or hour about and, an hour and a half. Hour and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of it at the end is Q&A, but really, really great stuff. Um, really, the only ground rules for tonight is if everyone uh, just keeps their mic on mute, uh, so that way we don't get a lot of background noise and it's hard to hear. Um, as Sarah and Larson lead us, they're going to they're gonna just share from Dr. Henry Cloud's talk and their own thoughts for like 30 to 35 minutes. And then after that, you're going to have a chance um, to ask some questions because surely you're going to have some questions that will flow out of that. So before I hand it off, let me pray and then we will dive in. Father, thank you. Um, that you've given us all things uh, pertain to life and godliness uh, through the knowledge of him who saved us, Jesus Christ. Um, we thank you that um, you have given gifts to the church, um, and two of those gifts tonight are going to pour into us, Sarah and, and Larson. And Lord, I just pray you give them freedom and liberty and joy and clarity um, to, to help teach us uh, what it means to walk through crisis and to do so in a healthy, successful, and ultimately victorious fashion. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to make the applications, not just for uh, the COVID-19 crisis, but any crisis that we're going through right now and crises that we will uh, face in the future. So Lord, would you strengthen us, uh, strengthen your people through this time tonight, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go. Thank you. All right, well, we'll just start by um, introducing ourselves and giving a little bit of background and then dive in. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Sarah Bavon. Um, I studied uh, counseling psychology at Moody Theological Seminary. I um, got my master's there a few years ago. Uh, and since then, I've been practicing at um, Sycamore Counseling and Coaching, where I work as a therapist, um, work with mostly teenagers and adults. And over the last year or so, really kind of found a niche in growing more um, and understanding trauma and working with people that have either experienced like childhood or developmental trauma, attachment issues, or even recent traumatic, traumatic events, um, which is really kind of what led me, kind of gave me a heart to pursue um, learning more about this, especially in the, the crisis that we're facing. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Larson Schollander, and I'm a uh, doctoral student at the University of Toledo studying clinical psychology. Uh, my research focuses on the assessment of narcissism and most recently on uh, prodromal psychosis. And my clinical um, uh, experience and, and preferences are in uh, treating anxiety, depression, and personality disorders. Uh, and so as Mike mentioned, uh, today's, uh, the purpose of today is one to summarize Cloud's uh, webinar, The Psychology of Crisis, and um, also to use our background and experience to maybe help translate this uh, to the family and to the individual level. Um, and so uh, at the end, you know, we'll answer questions uh, and that can be a good time for, for discussion and perhaps people, if they're willing, can share some of the things that have worked for them. And to call this as a crisis is, uh, 
truly appropriate. Um, COVID-19 is an unprecedented event that has caused uh, many to fall ill. Um, our own community here in Detroit has been especially vulnerable and has been devastated uh, by, uh, by this illness. Um, schools, businesses, and entire states um, have shut down over this. Um, and it's safe to say that our life now does not look like it did uh, before uh, the mi mid-March, uh, before COVID-19. Um, and uh, with this crisis, um, there has been an increase in substance abuse uh, and an increase in domestic violence. And uh, researchers project that there'll be as much as a 37% increase in attempted suicide. Um, and so, you know, we certainly want to be mindful of that as, as we're discussing this. Um, so first, what I'd like to do is just to kind of, I just want to um, say that it, it is natural to experience um, a whole host of emotions during this time. Uh, anything from uh, fear, anxiety, loneliness, sadness, depression, uh, frustration at the situation, uh, disillusionment. Uh, maybe with the authorities, um, and, and despair, just to name a few emotions uh, that you might be experiencing. Um, and it's also important to recognize that this is going to impact everyone differently. Um, everyone uh, is a separate individual, and so uh, folks in your family may be experiencing, the, experiencing this differently than you. Um, in our own community, and, and we know this, that um, trauma is quite prevalent uh, in the city of Detroit. And so someone with a history of complex trauma is gonna likely experience this time of unpredictability as being um, especially anxiety provoking. Um, and then for the introverts out there, uh, they're um, maybe feeling a little bit confused because all of a sudden they're wanting and craving social connection, whereas before uh, they, we're craving time to get away, be by themselves, and to energize. Um, and so, again, this affects everyone differently. Uh, and then this anxiety around the situation, it's, it's not going to decrease soon. Um, we just found out that Michigan is extending the stay-at-home order. But even in states like Georgia, where that's been lifted, uh, people are having to decide uh, whether or not they want to go to work to provide for their family or stay home so that they don't get their family sick. Um, and so they're wrestling with um, those decisions. Um, so ultimately, this impacts us uh, differently. And in order to understand how crisis impacts us, we should, should first discuss the purpose of emotions, uh, some of which will be coming up uh, during this time. So the purpose of emotions uh, really is to signal, it is a signal from our body telling us to do something. It motivates us uh, to, to do something to, to make some movement, um, to change things. Um, another purpose is to help communicate. Um, we all know what a happy face looks like and what a sad face looks like. And um, emotions, and that's true across cultures. So emotions really are a universal language that we all speak. And, um, and so the purpose of anxiety in particular is um, it, it's a response to unpredictability or lack of control over upcoming negative events uh, or dangerous events, um, one of which we are in, in the midst of right now. Uh, it also inspires us to be vigilant, to refocus our attention towards possible threats. So a little bit of anxiety, it, it gives us focus um, and it can help us concentrate, it can help us do well on tests uh, or prepare for a public speaking. Um, but too much can really uh, cause us to, to pull back and um, to par it can paralyze us. Uh, and then we all experience that a little bit differently in our bodies. So some folks feel you know, that tightness in their chest or, or tenseness in their shoulders. Um, their hearts might start pounding. So there, there are different facets to how that interacts with our body. Uh, sadness is another important emotion. Um, it, it tells us that we've lost something that's important to us and it initiates the grieving process. It tells us to withdraw and to, to reduce our activity and conserve our resources so that mourning can take place. Now, sadness can turn into depression where, where we've pulled back and then we pull back so much that 
we feel like we don't want to do anything that we can't do anything and then you know some people in some cases might start just laying you know sleeping at inappropriate times and, and not engaging with life the way that they used to um, and then happiness um, it, it tells us to keep doing what we're doing and as we're talking about these emotions, it's important to recognize that there's a difference between what we can call clean emotions and cloudy emotions. So clean emotions are, are you know, what we have here on the screen. Um, and the goal is to experience those uh, fully and completely when they come up. And if we don't, um, sometimes they can get stuck. They can get clogged uh, in the pipes, uh, so to speak. Uh, cloudy emotions would be like an emotion like shame and so sometimes what happens is um, uh, we as men might say um, I cannot feel sadness I cannot express sadness because that's a that's a weakness and and men should not be weak we have to take care of people um, and what that does is it's a judgment of a natural emotion um, that starts uh, the process of uh, shame and so inevitably we're all, men included, are going to feel sadness. Um, and to place judgment and then shame on top of that can cause um, that suffering that results from sadness to both um, increase um, and also to be prolonged. So it actually lasts longer and it is felt even more intensely um, when, we, when we stuff it down. Um, yeah, and so that was the main thing that I wanted to convey is that it's important to fully experience and process and your emotions, whether or not you believe that you should have them or not. Uh, and so now I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, who's going to talk a little bit more about the mechanisms of trauma. Oh, that was mute. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, we thought it'd be important to explore more. Um, of what trauma is. I know it's a word we hear a lot. Um, it can be maybe overused sometimes or underused, but I know that it has definitely been linked to what we're experiencing um, right now with COVID-19. Um, and so I feel that this time may help us to normalize some of what we're feeling, the stuff that, that Larson was talking about. Um, so just a basic definition of trauma would be the experience of something deeply disturbing or distressing. Um, and that could cover whole gamut of things um and it could be a personal experience like personal threat of harm against ourselves um uh, a time when we feel that we were threatened something disturbing we experienced it could be something we've witnessed or even uh, experiencing it through a loved one so kind of like a secondary trauma where um we are affected by somebody we were very close to going through a trauma um and i think it's pretty safe to say that the times we're in now there is a threat against a threat of safety, a lot of uncertainty. Um, and so just to give like a real brief understanding of the way trauma affects us, um, there's been extensive research that has conducted, been conducted on how trauma affects um, the brain, the wiring of the brain, or rewiring, um, as well as our body, the way that our bodies and our minds store trauma. Um, when we experience a traumatic event, a memory, um, it's stored in our limbic system. So that would be like our emotional brain. Our, the part of our mind that reacts um, is not logical thinking. It's the reason that we talk about triggers. So something happens and you can be instantly in that memory and forget reality because our frontal cortex, which is our rational reasoning part of our brain, it's like the, the limbic system expands and the frontal cortex shrinks. Um, and so this is what happens when we talk about somebody who has PTSD. Um, so whatever the past event may have been, when they're triggered, they lose all sense of reality. They are living in the memory. Um, and so something that's important to understand too is that having trauma does not necessarily mean um, a person will develop PTSD. There's a lot of things, factors in play. Um, there's protective factors that can come into play, whether it be um, safety and relationship. Do they have time to process the trauma immediately after it happens? Um, just many things that can play out. So PTSD would be something that develops down the road if um, these factors are not in place to protect a person. But um, what I think is important, so I actually, after listening to Dr. Cloud's um, 
uh, webinar, I listened to one by a psychiatrist who has specialized in trauma and a lot of the research on how trauma affects the, the body and the brain. Um, but his name is Bessel van der Kolk. And so what I found was interesting is he gave a list, and I'm going to share them with you, of um, preconditions of trauma. So basically, a person who goes through a traumatic event, um, these are factors that are going to be at play. Again, it's not guaranteeing this person is going to have PTSD. Um, but um, basically, I feel like this can help normalize maybe what some of us are experiencing, some of the emotions, the um, anxiety that Larson was talking about. Um, and really what we want to do after sharing this too is we're going to share basically a list of tools and resources that we can utilize to protect ourselves from these factors. Um, and so I'm just going to go through these. I have a feeling that, you know, as you look at them, you could probably guess um, how they can be linked to what we're experiencing right now. Um, so the first one is a lack of predictability. So imagine somebody, if you're experiencing even like a, a natural disaster, some kind of traumatic event, you don't know what's going to happen next. Um, it's very fear provoking. Um, and so I don't have to tell you that we're all kind of experiencing that even today, right? Like we have a date set and then it's extended on when um, the stay at home will be lifted. I was gonna say things go back to normal, but we don't even have that guaranteed. Um, it's hard to make plans like summer plans. Are they gonna happen, aren't they? So we can't even kind of predict what's gonna happen next. Um, it feels a lack of, of control. Um, and so the next thing is immobility. So really think of this as like, a lack of autonomy, a lack of decision on um, what happens to you personally. So with this can come a sense of helplessness. So for us, it's not that we can't move about. We have freedom to move our body, um, move freely about our homes, our yards probably, but even that um, we don't necessarily have decisions on where we can go. Or if we do go there, we have to make sure we have a mask, that we wash our hands. There's just not that um, maybe freedom we experienced before. Um, and something that's important with like, or something that's interesting with that as well as important to combat it, but kind of with that, like a person can get very agitated, like kind of this need to take over, to have power. Um, and, and research has shown that that can even lead to what they're predicting for like domestic violence or um, substance abuse because people are becoming kind of frustrated within. Um, and so we're gonna talk about it later, but just even the importance of movement, of exercise can really help um, combat that. Um, the next one is numbing or spacing out. Um, that one may not seem as relevant, but when we talk about that, it's kind of like what we <laughs> described as maybe zoning out. Um, it's really a way that our body protects itself. Um, so it can like, if you're, maybe you felt that, like I'm feeling overwhelmed, it's really hard to get done what needs to get done today. Maybe you just want to chill out on the couch. Um, it's like maybe after a while of like, we talk about like in trauma, the fight or flight, this is kind of more the freeze. It's like the fight hasn't happened at work. The flight, I can't get away, so I'm frozen. I'm numb. Um, clinically, we refer to this as like disassociation. So it's all—it's really a way that God has protected our body um, by like shutting out pain. People that experience extreme physical trauma can experience that. Um, and the next one, loss of connection. I'm pretty sure we all can relate with that. Um, we're having this meeting on Zoom, so we relate with it. Um, but really, yeah, just we're going through really hard times and then we're told not to be around people. Um, so thankfully for the, you know, some of us have people in our homes, some don't, but it's like that loss of just, it, it's good to, you know, use these um, platforms that we can see each other, but it's not the same as like being in physical presence, maybe hugging, um, being in physical contact with somebody. And so um, that can, and it's interesting because with trauma, one of the biggest protective factors is safety and relationship. And so this is something we're having to, to struggle through and maybe find creative ways to, um, to work past that. And uh, the next one, again, I'm sure we can all relate with, uh, Mike mentioned this at the beginning, but a loss of sense of time and sequence. So what day of the week is it? What do I have to do today? <laughs> um, what's my schedule look like? Like all of our schedules, I say for the most part, very few of us have probably had the same schedule that we had two months ago. Um, some of us it's changed, some of us it's completely gone. Um, those internal rhythms have been thrown off. So there is something about not knowing even where we are in the week. The days start to like blend together. Um, so somebody who's been through something traumatic can almost say that like I lost a sense of time. Um, 
and then loss of safety. You know, we, I feel like we experience this on a continuum. Some of us are um, at home more, maybe the safety concern is more of like a what if. Some of us I know are part of the body are on the front lines and this is a real risk daily um, that, that they're facing. Some of us have family members or ourselves have been inflicted with, with health issues with COVID. Um, so that's definitely at play. And then just the last one, and there's a lot to unpack with this, but the loss of sense of purpose, um, our sense of identity even is wrapped up in that. And it's interesting because I mean, you know, we, we all know God created us to work. He didn't create us to be couch potatoes, to um, lounge around. I mean, there's definitely a need for rest, but we feel productive. We feel a sense of purpose in what we're doing. Um, and that could have changed for some of us. And so what does that mean? And it can really challenge maybe where identity lies. Um, and so I don't know if as you're looking at that, um, you can relate with all or any of those things. I feel like we probably, again, all experienced on a continuum, some of us stronger than others, but all to some level are being impacted by these things. Um, and so with that, just recognizing that there could be um, long-term effects of that. Um, and so the next section we wanna just wrap up with is sharing some tools and resources with everybody. Um, and after we share these, we kind of want to open it up. I really love to hear uh, what's been working for everybody else. Um, you know, what are some things you've implemented creative ways you've not just like coped through this, but really found yourself thriving? What are some things God has done um, in you through this time? Or just, yeah, like, I think this would be a good time to share with each other, encourage each other, give each other ideas. Um, you know, we're how many weeks in we could be running out of ideas too. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the first one and the first two here kind of go together. I know for those of that, those of us that um, watched Dr. Cloud's webinar, he mentioned this, but naming it, Mike mentioned this in his sermon too, like naming it for what it is. Let's not, we, we got to put it out there and there's power in putting words to the situation. So identify what's going on for you. For all of us, it's, we're kind of in the same storm, but in different ways we're experiencing differently. Um, so naming what's happening for you, where your concerns are, what emotions are tied in with that. Um, and it's something that I really appreciated he shared, and I've actually done this with clients and found it really helpful, is making a list of things you can control as well as things you can't control. Um, and obviously the things that we can control are what are very anxiety provoking. It can feel overwhelming. Right now it could feel like that list is huge. Um, and it's an interesting time because we never had control anyway. And I like what Dr. Cloud said, that God's called us to self-control and that's it. But we're very sometimes consumed with those things we think we have some control over. And he's kind of stripping us of that right now. Um, so as you make that list, you know, even um, the areas that you can control that may be hard at first to come up with, but they're there. Um, and so just give yourself maybe 10 minutes to look at the things we can't control. Um, and maybe even set a timer. I'm only like a window of time. I'm not going to ruminate on it. Um, and those are things to really take to prayer, um, to really um, dig in with the Lord with, um, and then reflect on what we have control over. Um, where do those spiritual disciplines come into place? Where do I have self, where can I implement self-control? Um, and then the next thing is just building structure and schedule. And this can look different for everybody. Um, but I would just encourage not just for your day, but for your week, some kind of rhythm. Um, and even that can help with knowing what day of the week it is. So I know for us, like it helps to know Wednesday we have boiler room set. I have DNA this week. Uh, these are the days I see clients. So something kind of set each day that helps to keep some level of normalcy. Um, and then, and I've kind of found sometimes I need to switch it up, like kind of set a schedule for our family. And after a couple of weeks, I'm like, I need some variety. So change that. Um, Try to make it fun, bring in things maybe your family's never done before, um, or creative ways to connect with friends. So just again, like building not just an external, but an internal um, structure system can really help with that, that loss of time that we can experience. And I'll pass over to Larson to go through the rest. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. So the, the next one is uh, observing your thoughts. Um, and to illustrate this, imagine that you're going through like a dense, uh, dense woods or a thicket and you keep getting snagged on branches uh, or on thorns. Uh, you trip over roots. You can't see the light um, and you can't see where you're going. And sometimes this is what it feels like to be kind of caught up or entangled in our thoughts, uh, where it just feels like there's no way of getting out of it. And 
Another, a different way to approach our thoughts is to take a helicopter view. So imagine now that you're in a helicopter above the thicket. You can see the thicket or the woods below, and then you can see the light shining and you can see where you need to go and you can go and uh, move in that direction. Uh, so similarly, it's important to take a step back, disentangle ourselves from a thicket and try to take a helicopter view of what's happening around us. And we can do this through a number of strategies. Um, we can do this through mindfulness practice. Um, that, that's really geared towards this. Um, additionally, we can use uh, skills like journaling. So just writing out your thoughts. When you write out your thoughts, um, you take a step back and it provides some clarity and some focus to what you're doing uh, or, or to what you're thinking uh, and kind of keeps you from getting entangled. Uh, another benefit to journaling is that when you write down those, those fears, uh, those anxieties, those really painful thoughts that you're experiencing, it keeps you from running away or getting away from those things. It forces you to stay in contact with it. And in doing so, it robs those thoughts and those emotions of, of their power over you. Um, and so you'll notice that your, your anxiety, your sadness will decrease uh, the more that you do this, which is why people um, have a hard time getting started, uh, but they often feel a bit better, uh, a little bit better after they journal. Uh, and relatedly, it's important to continue to stay on track with spiritual disciplines. So prayer can function in much of the same way as observing your thoughts or journaling, uh, in the sense that you're taking it a step back um, and you know, you're presenting your thoughts. Um, you're also practicing some acceptance and even letting go and letting God be in control of, of what's happening just by engaging in prayer. Um, and so this has a re very real effect of one, disentangling us from our thoughts, and, and number two, staying in contact with that important, um, uh, those important emotions and important thoughts. Uh, scripture too can be really helpful in this area. So finding a psalm that loads onto an emotion that you might be experiencing. You might not have words to express how you're feeling, but the, um, there, there's a psalm for every emotion, there really is. And so to go to the psalms and to read those and to pray those psalms um, can give voice to your experience and it can help process the emotion and unclog the, the pipes, uh, the emotional pipes, so to speak. Um, Additionally, it's important to uh, engage in mastery and pleasurable activities. And this is right from a treatment for depression. Uh, mastery activities are any activity in which you feel accomplished after doing it. For some of us, it just might be getting out of bed and uh, getting dressed. That might be the accomplishment for the day. Um, it could be completing your chores, um, getting work done around the house, you know, building something with your hands, like cleaning, cooking, writing, any number of things that make you feel accomplished at the end of the day. And then pleasurable activities are really anything that just uh, is enjoyable. This could be anything from eating your favorite meal, uh, petting your cat, going for a walk outside in the sun, um, anything that is enjoyable to you. And by building these things into your daily schedule, uh, when you provide structure, and something to look forward to. But number two, you are actively pushing back against um, the depression or the sadness that might be setting in. Um, and related to this is, uh, well, and one other thing I should mention too, is that you shouldn't worry if you um, are not able to do the things that you used to be able to do um, as quickly. Um, productivity has, has decreased quite a bit because of all of the stress that is around us and the uncertainty and the unpredictability. Um, so the goal is to just get started doing some of these activities, even if it's taking you longer than it otherwise would have. Exercise is another important aspect of this. Exercise is one, it reduces stress and, and it reduces anxiety. It causes endorphins to flow and makes you feel good. Um, but also remember that sadness tells us to pull back. Uh, depression says stay home, stay inside, um, sleep during the day, um, and disengage with life. And exercise helps actively push against that. 
uh, by getting you engaged with life, uh, gets you moving and doing things. Um, and so that's a really good um, tool for um, managing this present crisis. Uh, which is why I really like how Lizzie has been offering these exercise classes because that is um, that is immensely helpful for everyone's uh, mental, emotional, and I think spiritual health as well. The next one is limiting our news intake uh, and social media. So uh, to borrow um, Pastor Mike's illustration, we want to be careful not to fall off onto the ditches on either side of this road. Uh, so on one hand, we don't want to completely uh, disengage and put our heads in the sand and, and pretend like nothing's happening. But on the other end, we don't want to just immerse ourselves in all of the negative and oftentimes speculative uh, news that just is floating around. Um, and this goes for uh, social media and the, uh, the various tribal wars uh, that are, are warring uh, on there. Um, social media and, and TV, uh, to be quite frank, are not refreshing to us, they, they don't refresh us. And so while it's good, okay to use it, um, it's important not to get sucked into it. Uh, and then the next one is, um, if you are having a difficult time, it's really important to talk to someone. And so um, it, that includes talking to a therapist or, or a psychologist. And Sarah and I have talked about uh, putting together a referral list uh, for folks in the body. And so this could be um, for therapists and psychologists in the community that can help uh, people uh, manage uh, this difficult time and also the future, uh, future difficult times. So that's it. Unmute this time. Um, and the last one, and this is going to lead into our last point, is just really be intentional um, about connecting with each other. Um, with friends, with family, and this can take creative measures, but I've seen it, uh, which is pretty cool to see, like just reaching out, um, whether it be scheduling, you know, Zoom dates with friends, um, going for a walk, you can put your earbuds in and talk on the phone and be a safe distance, but just really be intentional about being actively a part of your community. Um, you know, I know there's many opportunities that restore for that. I've been really thankful. I found that to be a lifeline. Like I said, whether it be the boiler room or Bible study, the women's Bible study we have, um, DNA, just, it's life-giving and we really need that. Um, and that just leads me into the last point we wanted to bring up. And that's just really staying ministry focused um, and about our community. So again, like, um, the, one of the best ways things we can do is thinking outside ourselves. Self-care is important and, and we need that. Um, but it really, it's about the health of the body, about the health of each other's brothers and sisters. And, um, and so really, you know, all the stuff we've shared, maybe you think some of this I can connect with some I don't, but don't assume everybody's on the same page. Maybe somebody's struggling more. How can we support each other, walk with each other, ask those honest questions, um, be transparent when we need to be. And so, um, really reaching outside of ourselves is, it's, it's about the gospel. It's about the body of Christ. Um, and the last thing really to think about there's as believers, but then where are ministry opportunities? Um, and so I, I think Larson had referenced this, but when we look at everything we just talked about, um, the effects of trauma, the effects of something like this, um, it is usually those that are marginalized, those that are in this lower socioeconomic class, um, with less resources that, are affected the worst, or the, the, yeah, the hardest. Um, and we also know it's all over the news. Detroit has been one of the hardest hit cities. We are in the midst of it. Um, it'd be hard to find somebody who has not lost uh, a family member or hasn't had a family member sick, maybe multiple ones. Um, and then when you have, whether it be complex trauma from the past, everything, we, we're in Detroit. We know the struggle that is here and the stronghold. Um, and so, people are going to be experiencing this much more intensely. Um, and so how can we as the body of Christ um, be very proactive and intentional in our community, whether it be next door neighbors, um, you know, involved in things like I know CDC is doing food outreach. Um, there's so many different ways um, to really um, use this time um, to be light in our community. Um, and so with that, that kind of wraps up what we wanted to share. Um, so we want to provide this opportunity. Again, if you have things that have been helpful for you during this time to share those, um, as well as any questions or thoughts. Um, so we were thinking with this, you could do one of two things. Um, you could share them openly here. Um, 
I don't know if I was mentioned this is being recorded, so we just want to put that out there, but, um, you know, definitely open up for discussion here. If you'd feel more comfortable shooting the question over to Mike, either like private message on here or text, then he can ask it um, from there. So um, again, any questions you may have about anything Larson and I shared, maybe specifically regarding um, the webinar, if you're able to watch that, and then just anything that's been helpful for your family um, or you individually during this time that you think would benefit the body. So um, we'll open it from there. So I will prime the pump, okay, with a question. First off, let me just say thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much, Larson. Really super helpful stuff, I think, both um, for now uh, in, in this present situation, but certainly uh, uh, helpful for the future because I think every one of us can look back on some crises, major, minor, medium, in which we did not respond in a healthy way and not only hurt ourselves, uh, we heard others, and we all ultimately, you know, really even tarnished the glory of God. So, you know, this is all walking in health is all very significant. Um, you mentioned sadness and depression, and I know there's not a, a fine line of demarcation, but um, how would you distinguish sadness from depression, and what are the implications? I know that's a, a, a pretty probably weighty question, but how would you? Distinguish between the two and what are the implications? A really good question. Um, so in one sense, we can think of, you know, sadness being maybe like a lower level of depression. So it might be a little bit less intense uh, in some ways. Um, so just, uh, you know, again, it's meant to initiate the grieving process. And, um, and then what can happen, though, is like that can get stuck or uh, depression can set in and sometimes this looks like um, kind of disengaging with with life um, less activities uh, sleeping at inappropriate times some people might have difficulty sleeping they might be more irritable um, and uh, sometimes this can come in cycles um, where they might be feeling fine one day uh, and then you know they might feel down or depressed for a couple of weeks so I guess one way of thinking about it as being different is depression has a whole host of other like feelings and, and manifestations associated with it, um, but it also is um, more severe um, and uh, oftentimes can last longer. Um, and another thing to point out too is that with depression, it's not always clear what the source uh, of that depression is. And in fact, there may not be a source. Um, whereas sadness is often closely tied. We, we can usually identify it. Um, well, we are sad because we've lost the freedom to move about and to engage in relationships the way that we would want to. Um, and so we are grieving that loss uh, of that freedom. Um, and for some people, they might be feeling that a little bit more strongly than others. That's super helpful. Even what you just said, I just wrote it down that Sadness, you can typically make a direct correlation, direct connection to some event, some, you know, incident, whereas depression may, may be not so easy. That's, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions on their heart or um, that you just is there that you, you're wondering? I see. Uh, I'm going to bring a question uh, that, that somebody shared with me. Um, What if, um, this person wrote, what if um, um, a close friend, uh, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, or a spouse um, suffer from depression and anxiety at this time, uh, how, can, how could this person better help them, is the question. Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, yeah, first, just want to say that, um, yeah, I'm very sorry for, you know, that that experience of uh, being in the midst of that. And I really empathize with, um, with being there and in, in, in that place, um, both in the position of like feeling that way, but then also having a loved one uh, who, who feels that way um, and is experiencing that. Um, and so 
I think one big thing is uh, simply being there to talk to, to the person. Um, you don't have to fix anything. Um, you may not be able to fix anything, but being a listening ear um, and being available to that person. Um, and uh, I think second, um, kind of recognizing when they need space and then when they're ready to engage. Um, and communication can help bridge that gap if you're not sure uh, where that is. Um, and third, you know, if they're not seeing a therapist, they, it might be worth considering, uh, considering seeing a therapist to help uh, manage the depression, help manage the anxiety. Um, I don't know, Sarah, do you have anything else that you'd add? Yeah, just kind of tagging on what you just said too, making sure you don't carry more than you're able to. Um, as someone, as a, being a person you love deeply, it can be very difficult to not, you know, you want to empathize and, and walk with them and, and be a support, but also know kind of maybe what your limit is and, and really assist them in seeking out maybe if they need more help. Um, because it could be easy to be swallowed in, into that. Um, but also walk, maybe it could even be helping them make a call, taking them, um, helping them find their, it's important to find the right fit. Um, and so assisting them in that, but, um, it can be hard. It's depression, anxiety are very closely linked as well. Usually with one, you get the other, um, and it can feel debilitating and overwhelming. So, um, kind of knowing what you can and can't do as well. Uh, I have a question, uh, I guess. And first, yeah, uh, thank you guys very much for sharing. I know it's been uh, helpful to maybe put some words or some phrases to things that uh, have been true of what I've been feeling uh, without maybe, yeah, knowing the, the best way to phrase it. So thank you guys. Um, and, and again, kind of like Mike's uh, question, um, that I'm sure there's a lot of nuance to this from person to person, but generally speaking, what are some good, um, I guess like red flags or indicators that you might be experiencing, um, whether it's anxiety or whether it's anger or whether it's frustration. I mean, what are just some good things to look out for, not only in ourselves, but maybe in our roommates or in, if we are at work, you know, if we are essential personnel and some of our coworkers that we could say, hey, it seems like you're really frustrated. Could I maybe help talk to you about that? I mean, what, what are some of those indicators? And again, I know that's really broad, really individualistic, but just kind of broad category. What are some of those indications in, in all of those categories? Hmm. One thing, um, I don't know if this helps, but we, we brought up both the anxiety and anger, and those are very closely linked um it's like two sides of the same coin so with uh and it both of them rev you up right so like with anxiety you get agitated it, it both have an issue of like power and control a need to fight for that right like if we're anxious it's because it's something we feel we have no control over as well as with anger um so i'm wondering even in that situation if you're seeing frustration agitation anger if there's more anxiety linked to it um and I don't know if that helps to understand, but like, like there might be some really, some struggles happening and how do you speak to that maybe over the anger part? Cause anger people get more defensive, but maybe like a, um, an approach of, I don't know, you doing all right, I see you're struggling here. Um, so that's that aspect of it. I don't know if that helps, but yeah. And with anxiety, you can, you know, recognizing it in your own self is, uh, you know, some people, they don't know that they're experiencing anxiety and then they need to like maybe check in with their body. And so some signs include what I talked about with the uh, heart pounding um, and, uh, and, and uh, feeling tense in your muscles. Uh, with anger, sometimes people describe sort of the heart pounding, but it feels different, um, a little bit more purposeful. Um, and uh, maybe like the rush of blood to the head, um, it kind of feel hot in their head a little bit. Uh, and anger really serves to motivate us to kind of push back against someone or, or something that's crossed a boundary in our lives. And uh, oftentimes what happens is when someone's kind of at their, the end of the rope, so to speak, and they're really strained, they're tired, they're not getting enough sleep, 
uh, sometimes it, it can be, they can snap at the least, you know, provocation, right? Um, so they're a little bit more irritable. Um, and sometimes they might even seem a little bit maybe paranoid and, and not to be judgmental about that, um, but they might even be looking for um, excuses to, to be hurt um, and to react. Um, and so um, it's important to, one, recognize that tendency in ourselves, but also um, that tendency in others. Um, um, so that maybe, hopefully that addresses both the, the experience of those emotions, recognizing it in yourself, and recognizing it in others. Um, yeah. I have a question. Um, okay, so the list of, of tools and resources that you guys provided was really helpful. Um, I found for myself, especially early on, um, once I was able to kind of do some of the things that you suggested, then like I feel I feel totally different now. I'm a lot better. But early on, there I just experienced this lack of motivation to even do any of those things. I don't want to journal. I don't want to initiate Zoom dates with friends. Like there's just this like lack of motivation and to even do the things that are going to be helpful. So do you have any recommendations for when you're in that place of having mm -hmm. tools that that would really help, but just lacking the motivation to even use those tools? Mm -hmm. Well, just like to first off, like normalize that experience. I bet everyone sitting here can say, yeah, <laughs> I've been there. Um, something too to recognize is that when we're in this, like the situation that we're all in, um, it's almost like our body that the stress hormones could be higher. We're like rubbed up a little bit more. And with that can come like kind of fatigue, lack of motivation, easily distracted. Um, and so, you know, like giving yourself grace with that too, that um, there are going to be those days. I think Larson had mentioned even with the productivity, like it may not be what it would have been two or three months ago. And um, and if you're wired like me, I'm wired in the way that if I'm not given a schedule, it's really hard to make it myself. So then I'm add that to it. <laughs> like I just don't work well with that. Um, and so sometimes it's it can be just as simple as taking, like even if you don't feel like it, one small step, like that proactive move forward can help spur everything else along. Um, and maybe recognizing there's days that it's okay to, to rest and take off and um, your body needs that. Your body's telling you something like I, I just can't function like I did. Um, yeah, so it's kind of kind of feeling out what you need at that point and um, accountability can help too. Like I know something that could help if you create some kind of schedule or something, have somebody check in that you're doing it or do it together or something like that. Um, yeah. And, and I'll just add to that um, it's hard to get started, but oftentimes opposite action is, is kind of a key uh, to like overcoming those moments of low motivation. And, and so that would be uh, engaging and doing the things that, um, that you don't want to do. I mean, it doesn't have to be like, all of it, it can be some of it. So just saying like, all right, well, today's a, a tough day. I'm not feeling motivated. I feel like I can't do anything, but I'm at least gonna do this one thing. And it can be small. It can just be showering and getting dressed and getting ready for the day. Um, and, uh, and then increasing those kinds of activities. Um, so those like mastery activities um, and those um, pleasurable activities and kind of building those into your day. And, you might not feel motivated at first, but the more that you do those things, it will push back against that lack, lack of motivation. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question regarding mm -hmm. balancing self-care and serving others. Um, they're both very important, right? Um, mm -hmm we are called to, first of all, lead ourselves. So I would put that in the category of self-care. Um, but of course, self-care could become selfishness. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, Jesus says, the way to find your life is to lose your life. So there's that service part. But the other ditch is you're serving so much, you're actually not caring for yourself. In fact, you're just, there's selfish olatry and service olatry, right, on, on both sides. 
So how do you how do you navigate? Uh, you know, just have a, a, a healthy, rich balance of self care and service. That's a good question. <laughs> um, I just, as you're talking, I was thinking of like really examining motivation. Um, is my motivation for self care because I want to be comfortable? I want to be it's more self-indulgent. Is it for the intent and purpose of being healthy? Um, because God calls us to care for our bodies, to care for ourselves, to, you know, not neglect and just, I don't know, that, you know, like just, there, there is a part of, we are the temple of God. Um, so is my purpose for self-care so that I can continue further the kingdom so that I can pour out, um, and same with service, right? Like that, very much our identity could be wrapped up and just go, 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 serve, serve, serve to the point of, just running ourselves ragged, usually because there is no self-care involved, um, burning out our family. Or, um, and so I really think it's a, examining your heart and your intent and purpose um, and either side that you may be. I think all of us maybe are prone to go one way or the other too. Um, and so maybe where, where am I more prone to lean towards um, in the spirit? Where can I balance that? Yeah. Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. That's really helpful. Anybody have a last question? I have, I have a question. First of all, yeah, thank you guys so much. I think the slide on experiences of trauma, I don't know, I've, I've spent a lot of time learning about childhood trauma and the adverse childhood experiences. And so I remember doing some of those surveys, but actually seeing like experience of trauma in that way. It just is almost, I mean, it's heartbreaking that seeing that the whole world is going through trauma in this way, like, um, but also eager to see how God is using it. So anyway, it's just kind of like, wow, like, like you said, normalizing, like, wow, we are experiencing trauma. Like this is, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I, I guess my question is, is there, how do you find that balance between moving forward and yeah doing those things that you enjoy and working and um things that maybe you need to do to provide for your family but also taking time to grieve to feel sad to reflect on wow like we were just in a staff meeting and we talked about our operations director said you know when you left this building mid-march that's not what you're going to be coming back to and so things like that, I'm just like, man, that's so sad. And thinking about seeing all the kids when we come back to preschool and masks. And um, anyway, so I spent a little time thinking about it. And then I'm like, okay, let me do other things I got to do in my day. But I don't want to suppress it either. You know, and not, like you said, not stuff it down. Mm -hmm. So what, I don't know, what could be a good balance of that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think what you just shared is really good, that you gave yourself time um, to, to grieve, to to acknowledge it to even the extent of how it's affecting you and i think we had mentioned just like even if it's 10 minutes to give yourself like a window of time to go there and be there and be present with it um and then move to something whether it be it, i mean obviously like just a deep prayer in that like in psalms david is very honest about his struggle and emotion and bring it before the lord um he's not just fluffing over and ignoring it um and then like, like that listy that you said you then went okay then let me leave, move forward like i don't god doesn't call us to stay there stay stuck in it either um and so like it could be um setting time each day to allow yourself to to be present with it um yeah if larson has yeah, I'll just add that um, I think you've really identified a, another ditch that we can quickly fall into. And as we we're talking about the mastery related um, activities or pleasurable activities or exercise, um, those can, um, as good as they are, they can also quickly become a way of distracting us or, or avoiding uh, the problems uh, that, that we're facing. Um, and so this is going to vary from person to person. But one question, uh, well, two questions that you can ask yourself is first, uh, what is the function of this? Uh, what is either the function of this activity that I want to do or I'm making myself do? Um, what is the function of the emotion that I'm feeling right now? Um, and, then, um, and then ask the next question would be, um, is it helpful? Um, and so generally speaking, going for a run is really helpful. It is really good for you. But in that moment, are you kind of distracting yourself? Are you avoiding something that needs to be 
managed or processed? Um, and if so, then you might want to put that run on hold. But on the other side of this, um, there is room to distract yourself for a little bit, and then as long as you come back to it. Um, and so sometimes we do this and we just like, feel like we can't handle anything more at, at this moment. So we might turn on the TV and turn our mind off, or we might start doing something busy um, just to get away from it. And um, that's okay, that's not bad in of itself, um, but it's important that we then return to that thing that we're dealing with, that, that grief um, or that, that loss that uh, we've experienced. So. Did that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Also, could you email a copy of the presentation that you guys did? Is that allowed? Like, could you disseminate? Sure. Mm -hmm. yes, I think I do that. Any other uh, questions that um, either people were hoping might be addressed by this webinar um, or um, anything else that's pressing for folks? I don't think this is, it's kind of a question, but one thing I've noticed, and I don't know about the rest of you if you are experiencing this, but I've noticed that my emotions are all over the map and I've, I've dropped into every single category that you guys have mentioned earlier on in your talk. Um, from sadness, happiness, you know, anxiety, anger, but I think you just touched um, on one that I think is overarching everything and I think it's grief and I'm glad you mentioned grief and but you know because there's so many things that we are grieving you know, we're grieving the loss of, you know, maybe our jobs, our, in, our, our par portions of our incomes or all of our incomes. And we're also grieving, you know, the, not the permanent loss of family, well, hopefully not, you know, but um, the, the temporary loss of family presence. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what are some things that we can do maybe to try to get ourselves out of that grief it's not your normal grief where someone has passed away and you know you're going going through that process it's a it's a weird kind of grief mm -hmm. it's a good point it's a it's a complicated grief and it, it's ongoing and there doesn't seem to be an end in in sight um, yeah that's really good a uh, good point and that and that grief is real i mean i just i shared this maybe in a boiler room or somewhere but you know, there, there, are, there are certain life events uh, that just can never be replicated, that are going to be missed or adjusted. I think of my son's high school graduation, which is going to be very small compared. I think of, you know, prom. I think of the, his, his senior baseball season. Uh, I think of my daughter uh, with an internship that she was hoping to get this summer. And uh, just, you know, there, there are things that are not going to be replicated. So people may be experiencing grief that they're not even realizing just yet. Uh, and so we really want to hold on to this. I just want to say thank you guys very much. This was great. Uh, really, really helpful. Um, it has been recorded, so I'm going I'm to uh, see if this can be sent out to the whole church body because I think it would just be helpful for people to expose themselves to. And uh, for those who are here right now or will listen, or who will listen later, I got two closing exhortations, chew and do, chew and do. I'm not talking about Copenhagen on the chew part. I'm saying just chew on this material, right? There was a lot there. Um, as I said earlier, that is, is helpful for health right now and invariably will be helpful for health later on. So really just think about this and have uh, discussions and conversations and reach out with any questions you would have. And then the do part, is maybe try and implement one of those tools, right? Something that maybe would be helpful um, for you to work through this current uh, COVID-19 crisis. Just really, you know, um, it's so easy to say, I'm gonna do something, but, but change and transformation do doesn't happen in the ethereal, happens in the actual, the tangible, the concrete. So maybe there's one step that you can take to implement something that you heard uh, this evening. Um, Again, really, really grateful. Thank you, Larson. Thank you, Sarah. Thank uh, you. For Opportunity. For this. Really, really appreciate it. Let's give them all a thumbs up, okay? Some of you I can just 
in your name. But let's give them a thumbs up uh, to express our gratitude. Um, uh, Pastor Charles, would you close us in prayer tonight? That'd be great. If you're even around. I don't know if oh. Uh, okay. I'm going to ask okay. Andrew, <laughs> okay, you are there. Okay. Eating a little popcorn. She is back, Joe. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you that you can, through all things, be glorified, where we can be drawn and grown closer to you uh, in that process. And we just thank you for the time that we've had today, um, just for this last hour, uh, to be able to take uh, the information you've given in the world of psychology, but then to be able to uh, tune it through a biblical perspective and understand that you're at the center of it. And there are things that happen in us physically and emotionally, uh, and that you are continuing pouring out your grace and giving understanding of how that flows. And we just thank you that we're able to just walk through this moment uh, and be able to process some of that. Uh, I pray that our hearts uh, would be stirred up for more of you and, and more of a just a wow of how you've created the human body uh, to deal with things. And um, I just hope that by your grace, um, all of this points clearly back to you and just stirs us up for more of you and, and to look at some of the takeaways of what we can and, and should be doing in the midst of this crisis in which we're really stirred up uh, with angst in different ways amongst us. And so, Father, we love you. Uh, and we just praise you uh, that continually um, we can look and learn different ways uh, to move through a crisis and at the center and still be you, Father. And so I just lift up everyone here, um, wherever they are in that process, uh, not only would they see more of your grace and mercy poured out, um, but they would be able to take some of the things that have been uh, laid out before them during this last hour and just use those things onto you. Uh, and be able to share it with others, too, uh, as we are called to just love on each other and share with each other and confess to each other. So, and Father, I just pray that we can use these gifts and, and, and use them with others. And so we lift up all these things, Father, in your matchless name. Amen. Amen. Miss you guys and love you. See you soon. Have a great night.